So two Sundays ago, we looked at our commission, what God has called us to do in Matthew chapter 28. We're going to read that in a second. And I appreciate that it was perhaps a, a, a hard-hitting message at times. As I was preaching, I was thinking, crumbs, this is a bit hard-hitting. But I think sometimes we need those hard-hitting messages to stir us to action. And I take comfort from the fact that when you look back at the sermons preached by Charles Spurgeon, John Wesley, um, and uh, many others, um, they were a lot more direct and straightforward than, uh, than mine was. So um, I think we've, we've lost some of that sometimes in our, our teaching to stir the church up because we're not just a social club, are we? We are a family, aren't we? Yes, that's great. This is wonderful. What else can we get away with? Um, and uh, so this week I want to move on from looking about our commission to how we make disciples. So the Great Commission, Jesus came to them, so the disciples, and he's talking to us as well, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, there's a command to go, that means we've got to move, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. So there's a, it's, it's a command of action, but we often talk about making disciples, don't we? But we often don't talk about how we make disciples. We're called to make them, but how do we make disciples? That's what I want to look at this morning. So the first question we need to ask is, what is a disciple? Well, John Piper, and some of you will know John Piper. Um, he's an American uh, pastor and Bible teacher. And I'm going to be quoting from a couple of sources this morning because there was some great stuff that I found when I was researching for this morning. So what is a disciple? John Piper says, people need to become Christians and people need to be taught how to think and to feel and to act as a Christian. That is a disciple. So I'll just leave that up there for you to, to look at as we carry on. But people need to become Christians and people need to be taught how to think and feel and act as a Christian. That's a disciple. In other words, just becoming a Christian doesn't mean you know, you've kind of crossed that line and, and, and now you're in the kingdom or now you're in the club and, and that's all you need to do. That's the beginning of the journey of becoming a Christian. Then there is a process of discipleship. Now, the word discipleship, interestingly, never occurs in the Bible. Did you realize that? The term is actually ambiguous in English. It can mean my discipleship in the sense of my own pattern of following Jesus and trusting him and learning from him. Or it can mean my activity of helping others be disciples in that sense of learning from him and growing in him. The second meaning of making disciples is helping others. So the verb in the New Testament Greek as uh, in Matthew, which means to make disciples. It can mean to preach the gospel so that people get converted uh, to Christ and become Christians and the disciples. And if you remember uh, Peter's uh, sermon on the day of Pentecost, that was uh, one example. Um, Acts 14, 21 also says, when they had preached the gospel to that city and made disciples, they returned to Lystra and Iconium. So they preached the gospel and they made disciples. Now, the word make disciples is one Greek word there, and it means to get them converted to Jesus. So part of discipleship is about getting people converted to Jesus when they make that decision to follow Jesus Christ. And as I shared last week, um, last Saturday, week last Saturday, uh, we went to the Franklin Graham God Loves You tour, and many, many people, hundreds, responded to the call to come to know Jesus as their personal saviour. It was a wonderful thing to be part of. So that's one meaning. Or it can mean the whole process of conversion. So like baptism and teaching the ways of Jesus as it's used in Matthew 28, 19 to 20, when Jesus says, go therefore and make disciples. And here's what Jesus means. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. So we go, we make disciples and the way that we do that once they become Christians is we then baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all I've commanded you. So baptism isn't the journey, conversion isn't the end of the journey. Baptism isn't the end of journey. The journey continues. And actually the journey continues for all of us every single day until we breathe our last breath uh, on this earth. So it's a very long process. It's, it's a lifetime of a process. I'm still being discipled by other people, by the stuff I read, um, and the same way I kind of pass that on to you or to other people. So, so get them converted, baptize them, and then spend a lifetime teaching them to obey all that Jesus said. That is what the verb disciple in the New Testament would include. And it should be noted that we can actually prepare people for a life of following Christ and learning about him um, 
before they become Christians. It's like pre-discipleship. How many people do we know that have been part of, of uh, perhaps home groups, life groups, as we call them here, or coming to church and they learn all this stuff, but they're not yet a Christian, and then they take that step, the st- step sorry, to become a Christian. So there's, a, there's kind of pre-discipleship that goes on. It's not just about doing it when people have become Christians. We can actually do it before people become Christians, sharing about God's love, the God's destiny and purpose and plan he has for their lives, and, and all kind of things, because lots of people out there have got all kinds of questions just like you and me when we look at stuff in the world and we go where's God in this what does the Bible say about this how can God allow this all those kind of questions are going on out there and certainly going on with our young people talk to your young people and I had a great conversation with my daughter and uh, our middle son David about um, why young people struggle coming to church and it was really interesting talking to them and learning from them and listening to them and discipling them it's a wonderful privilege so Knowing that we are called to make disciples, both learning ourselves and helping others to learn, how do we actually make that work? How do we undertake that work? How do we actually do it? So we start by recognising and applying the passage in Matthew 28 as a command from Jesus. That's where we start from. That's the, that's the command Jesus gave. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all things until the very end of the age. So that's what Jesus commanded us from. So it's not optional, just in case you thought maybe it's optional. It's not optional. It's not just the pastor's job, okay? It's all of our job. It goes with the blessing of being a Christian. It's being saved. We're saved by grace. And because of that, we should want to do what God has called us to do. How many people have been given a gift by someone or someone's paid you an act of kindness? And in response to that, you accept that. But in response to that, you want to... You want to bless that person for their kind of kindness to you, don't you? Maybe, maybe someone invites you over for dinner and it's a lovely time and you, re- you return that kindness by inviting them back to you for dinner. Or maybe if you can't cook, um, you take them to Costa or wh- wherever you go, okay? But there's, there's a sense in which when someone does something for us, we want, to, we want to say thank you. We want to pay that. We want to honor and recognize what that person has done for us. And it's the same with, the, with what Jesus has done for us. In fact, it's, what Jesus has done for us is far greater um, than take us out for a meal or a coffee at Costa. Um, Jesus has done something far greater. And so because Jesus has commanded us in Matthew 28 to go and make disciples, our response should be, absolutely, I'm going for it. What do you want me to do? Who do you want me to disciple? Where do you want me to go? Next, we learn that the Apostle Paul discipled Timothy. So we look for examples in the New Testament of people who've dis- p- discipled other people. So the Apostle Paul discipled Timothy. Who was Timothy? Timothy was a young pastor in the early church of Ephesus. And Christian tradition states that he became the first bishop, which bishop means overseer, uh, of Ephesus too. So Paul said to Timothy, and the things that you've heard from me among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So there's a pattern there. So Paul teaches Timothy, Timothy teaches others, others teach others, and others teach others, and so on and so forth. You see how it works? So as well as knowing that we are disciples, learning biblically and growing as Christians, being guided and taught by the Holy Spirit, who is the helper. Amen. Discipleship is also about passing on what we've learned in an intentional way. What do I mean by an intentional way? So it's not just about sort of a passing conversation about, do you know what? God just said this to me to give to you, which is brilliant. That's absolutely right. But about following up with that person. What do you think about what I shared with you that God had told me to tell you? Did you pray about it? How did that go? It's not just about having a conversation and sharing a Bible verse with someone or doing a sermon or something and, and then kind of forgetting about it. It's following up with that person, doing it intentionally, purposefully, going out of your way to make disciples, having those kind of conversations, challenging people lovingly and journeying with people. And wanting those that we pass that learning on to, to then pass it on to others. So as a father, I have pastored my children. I've discipled my children. I'm sure I could have done it better. Anyone fathers here? Do you ever think you could have done a better job with your kids? Everyone's hand should be up. Unless, of course, you're perfect. Then I want to come and learn from you, right? (laughs) But I pass on to my kids. And then my hope is that my kids will then pass on to their kids. And their kids will pass on to their kids. Because when I was young, my mum and dad discipled me. And then other people at church and people I knew disciple me, and then I pass that on and so on and so forth. Pastor, discipling someone doesn't mean you're going to become a pastor, okay? It might do. That may be what God has for you, but it doesn't mean that. We can all disciple people. 
Now, there are three ways to disciple people, three different ways that we can do it. So let me just show you these three ways, because this will help us as well as we go forward. The first one, these are three models, if you like. The first one uh, is the discipleship model of one to many. So this message is easier to understand. It has two forms, corporately, uh, corporate worship, rather, and small groups. It's where one person disciples or teaches a larger group. So what I'm doing now is that kind of, is that one to many. So I'm discipling you as I teach you and share with you what God has laid on my heart for the church today. So that's one of the ways we do it. One of the other ways we do it is in small groups. We call them life groups here at Shenley Christian Fellowship, as you know, and, and sort of one person teaching uh, a larger group of people gathered called a life group. So that's one model. Second model is one to few. So these discipleship groups would typically have four uh, or five people that meet to study the Bible, typically study a book or study a topic uh, for maybe 12 to 18 months, that kind of idea. Now, don't get caught up if your uh, group has, uh, you know, say four or five, if you've got six or seven, don't worry too much about the numbers. But it's about um, one to few, so sharing and discipling um, with one another, and sharing the journey you've been on and your thoughts about the passage and, and how things, you know, what, what you think God is saying. So that's one to few. And the last one, and this is the one that most people think of when you talk about discipleship, is one-to-one. So this kind of model um, is where a mature believer sits down and mentors a new or spiritually immature believer. And let me just say that doesn't mean they've, um, that they've just become a Christian. Because there's a lot of Christians who are spiritually mature. They've become a Christian a long time ago, but they've never had that discipleship. or They've never studied. They've never spent that time growing. And so sometimes you can disciple someone who's been a Christian for years, but is spiritually immature. And don't think of the word immature in a negative thing, because we all, in one sense, we're, we're all immature, growing into maturity in Christ. Okay, So they're the different ways we can do it. And the idea of that one-to-one uh, model is that, that we pour 100% into the person that you're discipling, meeting weekly, holding each other uh, accountable. That's the third way of doing it. So if, if we're discipling in one of those three ways, how exactly do we do it? What do we say? What do we do? Well, Francis Chan uh, is an American author, teacher, and preacher. And he offers some helpful advice uh, when studying the Bible. There's Francis Chan. You can see him there. He says, when discipling someone, two basic questions could be, when you're studying the Bible, what does this text say and what am I going to do about it? Okay, two very simple questions. What does this text say and what am I going to do about it? And then he goes on, he says, please remember that the process of discipleship is going to look different with each person and that it can be as simple as getting with someone and asking them questions. These questions can range from what they are learning in their journey through scripture, how they are, they are applying what they are learning and how they are processing their particular life situation in light of the Bible. So actually, it's not a massively difficult task. In fact, actually, it's quite a pleasurable task. You see, discipleship, discipling someone, as well as asking those questions, also involves involves praying with them, praying uh, with them and over them. And it's surprising. I've been in church kind of all my life, and it's surprising the number of people in, in different contexts that will struggle to pray out loud. But actually, that's something we should be comfortable to do because we're actually praying to God, right? We're not, we're not praying to each other. We're praying to God. So we should have no problem praying out loud. And sometimes I think it's because we worry that we're going to get something wrong. But you know what the wonderful thing is? God understands when we get things wrong. Yeah? He's a forgiving God, a loving God. And even if we get something wrong, the right, ask it the wrong way around or we say the wrong thing, God understands. And the, even the, another great thing is that people will understand as well because we've all been there, right? We used to do a, um, a scripture union holiday mission, Diamond Diggers of DL. I've talked to you about that before. And uh, one of the things we used to do is we used to have a 6.30 prayer meeting, which is when you've got a team of teenagers, getting up at 6.30 is not, um, not a helpful kind of thing to do. But that's what the thought, you know, every day for, I think it was seven days, um, to get up and, and pray. And we, we, we stayed in dormitories in the back of the church. And then we all met in the church, in the sanctuary itself, for a devotion. Then we split up into prayer groups. There were four or five dotted around the church. And the guy that kind of headed up the mission said, Everyone, he encourages, everyone's got to pray. Everyone's got to pray. 
And I'll tell you what, you know, you, you listen, and you could see the fear on some people's faces, right? You put yourself in that context. And yet, as they started doing it, they found out actually how easy it was. And as they went through the week and then they came back onto the team year after year, it became a natural thing. I think sometimes we sort of say to people, you don't have to pray if you don't, out loud if you don't want to. Maybe we should be saying, you know what, you've got to pray out loud. You encourage you to pray out loud because it encourages us to build our faith, to build that relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't worry, I'm not going to tell you to do that right now. But discipleship helps to build our understanding and our relationship with God, which should make that praying easier. So, so if we know how to make disciples, we know there's, there's three different models, and one of the classic ones is the one-to-one -one model. That's the kind of thing we're encouraging you guys to do this morning, right? And we know that some of the, there are some basic questions that we ask that you don't, you know, it's not really complex. Um, how, how do we know who Jesus is calling us to disciple because you could look around the room and there's lots of people and you go well who, who on earth where do I start in asking someone well it's actually very simple you simply ask God who he has placed around you it's that easy say God who have you placed around me that you want me to disciple and it's likely that there will already be a relationship forming of some sort in there it's unlikely that say you to go up to a complete stranger i mean maybe he'll do that um who am i to know the mind of god um he may ask you to do that but it may well be that you've got a relationship with someone that's that's sort of been growing and that's a good place to start francis chan says there may be unbelievers in your midst that need pre-discipleship we talked about that a few minutes ago which is intentional about living and speaking the gospel into them in the hope that 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 person might repent of their sin and begin a life of following jesus if there are other believers in your midst, discipleship may involve having a set time of doing life together and growing in those areas of perceived weakness. And here's one something that I really want you to hear this, okay? You don't need a degree or training in theology to disciple someone, okay? You don't have to spend £9,000 a year or whatever university fees are. It was less at, Mo at Morelands because they're the best Bible college. But you don't have to go and spend all that money. You don't need a degree or training in theology to disciple someone. When I went to Bible college, a lot of what we learned didn't necessarily... It wasn't necessarily stuff that I used for discipleship. When I went to Bible college, it didn't teach me how to lead a church, right? There's a heck of a lot Bible college is brilliant for, and I'd recommend if you feel God calling you to go for it, go for it. But you don't need a degree or training in theology to disciple someone. See, the Holy Spirit is better than any degree or any training course that you can attend. Yeah. You with me? So if God is calling you to go to Bible college, do it. It was one of the best three years of my life. But... You don't have to do it, okay? You don't have to go to Bible college. See, discipleship does take courage. It does take courage. And finding that courage will not be achieved by looking inwardly, yeah? It's we have to go on an adventure. I've just had this word adventure on my heart this week. Encouraging people to go on an adventure with God. Because we, sometimes we don't like adventure, do we? But when you watch these films about people who go on an adventure... You think, who remembers Indiana Jones and all the, the Last Crusade, the Raids of the Lost Ark, Temple of Doom, all that kind of stuff? Great, the adventure. Look at the adventures he had. Look at the people he met. Look at the rewards he got, right? Now, I'm not saying you've got to have a, a, a hat and a whip and everything else like Indiana Jones, but it's about going on an adventure. Don't look, don't look inward just at me. What, can I, what do I feel comfortable with and how can I live my life and I, got, I can't do this and I can't do that? Look outward, look for an adventure, look at what God can do through you. Outwardly, we look to the finished work of Christ on our behalf as we pray for God to provide the needed courage to engage in discipleship making. We can do this because Jesus lives in us and because the work he has accomplished. Amen. And courage also comes easier when we realize that God is actually with us in the discipleship process. His children are never isolated from the vine that's providing the needed fuel to engage with other people. So God will give you the words that you need to say uh, to people that you're discipling. God will fill your mouth with the words you need to say. But if it's the terminology of discipleship that's bothering you, right? Because sometimes we get hung up on terminology. If it's the terminology that's bothering you, as John Piper says, he says, I think what is important is not the terminology, but the reality. People need to become Christians and people need to be taught how to think and feel and act as a Christian. That is a disciple, a follower of Jesus, one who embraces him as Lord and Saviour and treasure. 
So just do it. Don't, don't sit there and go, right, I've got to do discipleship today. Just do it, right? And actually, the more you do it, the more natural it becomes. Now, the New, Dem- New Testament demonstrates different ways that discipleship actually happens. Sorry, the text is a little bit small. but um, So Titus chapter 2 and verse 4 talked about older women training younger women. How many of you older ladies have passed on your wisdom and advice to younger ladies about raising children, doing, you know, all that kind of stuff? Maybe you have, maybe you haven't. But that's one way in Scripture the older women train the younger women, right? Just as mothers, you train your daughters, right? 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 2, Paul trained Timothy to train others to train others. We talked about that earlier on. Ephesians 6 chapter 4, fathers are to train their children. If you're a father here today, then the responsibility for teaching your children, discipling your children in the things of uh, Jesus Christ is not the church. It's not transformers or youth. It's fathers. It's your responsibility. Yes, you do that with your spouse, but it's actually your responsibility first and foremost to train your children in the home. That's what scripture says. The other stuff, the church and the other stuff, that supplements what you teach, but it's your responsibility. Matthew 28, 20, missionaries are to teach the nations everything Jesus commanded. The Baptist denomination were great at sending out missionaries and people still go out on missions to teach other people about the love of Jesus today. Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 13 says, All Christians, how many? All Christians are to exhort each other every day to avoid sin and to stir each other up to love and good works. So we're we're encouraging one another, helping each other to avoid sin. We're we're journeying together because we want to see the best for each other. Amen. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 10, all Christians are to use their gifts to serve others. So whatever gift God has given you, it's not just for you, it's to serve other people. And Acts chapter 18, 24 and 26, a couple called Priscilla and Aquila, on the spur of the moment, it would seem, explain the way of God more accurately to someone called Apollos. And you can go and read that story in Acts 18 uh, yourself. So you don't need to only disciple one person, okay? So when I said earlier on about praying and saying to God, who is it you want me to disciple? You don't only need to disciple one person. It could be that you have two or three people that you disciple. You remember with Jesus, he had the 12 disciples, but there were three of them that he was closer to, and he seemed to invest more into those uh, three people. But don't overload yourself. That's the key thing. Don't overload yourself. In order to disciple others, you yourself need to be discipled, right? I used to teach drums um, to to little kids. I remember the first time... (laughs) I went to teach, uh, it makes me laugh every time I think about it, I went to teach this, this kid phoned up and he said, um, I'd, I'd like you to teach me, actually his neighbours went to the church we were at, and I said, that's great, do you have a drum kit, because you can't learn to drum if you don't have a drum kit, right? So he said, yes, I've got a drum kit, so I went around to his house and his parents took me down into the basement, um, or the cellar, cellars are brilliant, I wish we had cellars in Milton Keynes, they're wonderful, and he took me down and there was this toy drum kit, and it kind of wasn't quite what I was expecting, <laughs> So for the next few weeks, we moved him to the church, and I taught him at the church, and then said to his parents, you need to buy him a drum kit. Um, and last I heard, he was, he was drumming in the West End, so I, I didn't teach him that. He went on from me, um, and probably got far better tuition. But you obviously need to know a little bit more than the person you're discipling, because you're passing that information on, that stuff that you learned, okay? So don't overload yourself. You have to be discipled in order to pour others. If you keep pouring into others, but no one's pouring into you, then you're going to run out of steam. Okay, You're going to wear yourself out. But if you are being discipled, my sense is stick with one person for a time. So if, if you are discipling someone else, maybe you have one, two, three, whatever God lays on your heart. But if you're being discipled, my suggestion is you stick with that one person who is discipling you. But in addition to that, that's on a one-to-one basis. But in addition to that, draw on other good, solid, biblical in, uh, input. A bit like you get in your life group or you get on a Sunday. And there's loads of amazing teaching out there that you can access via the web. There's a lot of rubbish, but there's also a lot of good stuff as well that you can gather. So in conclusion, the truth uh, is this. The conversion of people from non-Christians to Christians and then discipling them should be part of everyday life. Just like breathing is part of everyday life. Getting out of bed, if you're physically able, and getting on with your day is part of everyday life. So should discipleship be. There is no one way or one strategy to how it's done, okay? There's no one way or one strategy because we're all created differently. No, every Christian should be helping those not yet Christians to take that step to follow Jesus. That is making a disciple. And every believer should be helping other Christians to grow and become more like Jesus. That is also making 
a disciple. Living out the Great Commission in Matthew 28 and therefore doing discipleship is an amazing opportunity. So don't do it because oh, I've got to do it because the pastor said. Or I don't know, I've just got to do it because the Bible said. Actually, look, at, look what is it, how does it feel? How, what happens when you do it? Well, it's an amazing opportunity because you are partnering with God to grow someone else's Christian life. It's such a privilege. You want to, for those of people who've um, preached um, at the front, it'd be interesting to, to ask them, but I'm sure they would say it's such a privilege to be able to, to sit down and study God's word and learn what God is saying for you to share on a Sunday or maybe in a life group or whatever. It's such a privilege to do that. So if you want that amazing opportunity, then, then this is the thing for you. Also, it's fun and rewarding. It's fun. If, if someone said to me, you can't be a pastor anymore, you can just teach, I'd be like, that's wonderful. I love doing this teaching stuff. It's fun. It's rewarding. And it's also rewarding because when I prepare stuff, I learn stuff um, that I never knew before. And when I teach it, I suddenly think, crumbs, God's pointing his finger at me in that one. It's not just stuff I'm saying to you. It's like God's highlighting stuff in me that needs to change as well. It's rewarding. Partnering with Jesus is both fulfilling for the receiver and fulfilling for the giver. It's not about doing it under duress. Is it optional? Absolutely not. It's not optional. We're all called to do it. Is it for those trained in theology? Thankfully, no. The truth is, it's about partnering with our saviour, Jesus Christ, to see other people learn to become more like Jesus and to pass on what they've learned, what the Bible says to others, for the cycle to continue. So, who has Jesus placed on your heart and I'm, if I could highlight everyone's names, then I would go round the room and point at each of you. But I guarantee if I go round to each person in the room, your name, which I know, will just go out of my head. It just it happens when I do communion. It's really embarrassing. So I'm pointing at every one of you. I'm asking each and every one of you individually. And maybe over coffee, I will ask you. So don't rush off. Who has, who has Jesus placed on your heart to start discipling this year? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for the call to go and make disciples of all nations. Father, we thank you that when Jesus returned to heaven, he didn't just say to the disciples, right, great, that's the work done. I'll, do it, I'll take it from here. He actually gave us a command to go, to get involved. And every single one of us can do this. Every single one of us. And Father, sometimes we recognise it does need courage because we, we can be quiet people. We can be kind of people just like our own company, our own space. You've created us all differently and we recognise that. But Father, the differences you've created in us, there will be other people who have the same or similar differences who we can relate to in unique ways. Everybody is created for a purpose and you have a destiny for each and every one of us. And you've called all of us to go into the world and preach the gospel. And Father, the world for us starts on our doorstep that's where the world starts the world for us is in our workplace the world for us is our family the world for us is the local community in which we live the world for us is the supermarket father where we go shopping each and every week the world for us is 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 at our doctor's surgery or hospital where we may spend time uh, every week or regularly father help us to look for every opportunity to disciple someone and just lay on the hearts of our people here this morning who it is that you've called them to disciple. Just give them a name. Give them a, a picture of a face. Let's just pause. Pause and ask God right now. This is you doing this. Ask God, say, God, who have you called me to disciple? And Father, for those of us, um, Father, when we're, when we're doing that discipleship, help us also not to burn ourselves out. I pray you pour into us the things you want us to pour into other people as well. Jesus, we live busy lives. You know that. You see that. But show us, Father, when we need to put down Facebook, to turn off the television, and to actually spend that time discipling someone, loving someone, coming alongside someone, and pouring into them what you have poured into us. Jesus, will you do that work in us this morning, we pray. But not just this morning, this afternoon. Tomorrow, next week, next month, following years, until the day you call us home, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this morning's service. It's been great to have you with us. I just wanted to very briefly share with you 
how you can give your heart to Jesus. I gave my heart to Jesus. I became a Christian when I was eight years old at a kid's summer holiday club. And it was an amazing time. And I remember praying a very simple prayer and I remember the feeling in my heart, in my life, that I just had that feeling inside of me. Something changed when Jesus came into my life. And the great thing is that when we do it, when we ask Jesus into our life, he doesn't just add it onto his to-do list. It happens straight away, straight away. And it's just, it's, it's the best decision we could make in life. You can change the trajectory of your life when you ask him in. And when he comes in, he comes in to, to be your friend, to be your Lord, to be your savior, to be your helper in difficult times. And you know, I've been through some incredibly difficult times in my life, but I know that God has helped me every step of the way. Jesus has been with me every step of the way. And when I've had important decisions to make, I've prayed about them. And Jesus has helped me to make the right decision. When I've gone through tough times, he's comforted me and enabled me to get through those difficult times where otherwise I probably would have taken another course of action, but he's helped me in those times. And so when I was eight years old, I remember praying a very simple prayer and, and the prayer involved just these few simple sentences. I asked Jesus to forgive me. I admitted that I'd done something wrong. I repented of my sin. And I made that 180 degree turn to start following him. And so if you want to do that this morning, if you want to take that step, then I want to help you pray that prayer. So if you're ready for that now, let's do it now. So just pray after me. Lord Jesus, I recognize that I have sinned. I recognize that I've done my life my way. I'm sorry for the things I've done wrong. I repent of my sin. Please come into my life. I choose right here, right now, to make that 180 degree turn and start following you and living my life the way you'd want me to. Please come into my life to be my Lord and Saviour. And if you've prayed that, then that's then fantastic. I'm so pleased for you that you've changed the trajectory of your life. You have made the most important decision you could make in your entire life. But I want you to do two things for me. The first thing is this. I want you to get in contact with me and let me know that you've prayed that prayer. And the reason is because then we can be accountable to one another. We can support one another. So when you send me an email, the email address will come up at the bottom of the screen. I can get back in touch with you and I can send you some, some information to help you uh, on your journey as a new Christian. The second thing I want you to do is to get into a good church. Now I don't know where you live, if you live in Milton Keynes you're welcome to come to Shenley Christian Fellowship or there are other great churches in this city that you can be a part of. But if you live at other places in the country then I want to try and help you find the church to be a part of. It's important that we're part of a church which is welcoming a church that teaches the Bible, a church that believes in great worship, and also a church that will help you on your journey as a Christian. We call it discipleship, but, but it's basically teaching us how to, how to live our life as a Christian. And so I want to help you do that if I possibly can. So thank you for being with us this morning. I'm so pleased that you made that step, but if you haven't prayed that prayer and you still need time to think, then I want to encourage you to think it through. And I want to encourage you to pray and ask Jesus and say, can you help me in making this decision? Because he will do that. And, uh, and we, I just want to bless you this morning. So just take care and stay safe.